Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for that very kind introduction. And uh, Daniel and I work at the same institution, so I know he has to join our president and dean over on the Hill, but it's really great to have you to come and introduce me. Very kind introduction. Now I've got to try to live up to it. So, <laughs> but let me say that I'm delighted to be here. I want to commend the Center on Health Disparities at the Adventist uh, Healthcare Center for your outstanding work. Commend you for that health equity report. I look forward to reading it. It's um, obvious that you have a real commitment to moving this nation forward uh, and the world toward the goal of health equity. And I say the world because I think many of you know that the World Health Organization um, has a goal of global health equity. And in fact, it was in the context of that goal that we did the social determinants of health work. I served on that WHO commission for four years. And we traveled all over the world looking at how different countries were dealing with social issues that were impacting health. And out of that came the WHO report on social determinants of health and the goal of global health equity in the next generation. You know, um, it's really important, the goals that you set, whether those goals are being set for you as an individual, as a family, as a community, or as a world, the World Health Organization. Um, and it doesn't say when you're going to reach the goal. Unlike objectives, uh, goals are not necessarily time specific, um, and goals are not as measurable as objective, but they're very clear about where we want to go. And of course, um, as um, that African proverb says, um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So it's important for us to know where we're going. And, and uh, we're committed to global health equity, and that's a great thing. I'm delighted to see many of you. Uh, I've had an opportunity to work with many of you in the past. Um, I'm looking straight back there, Dr. Woody Kessel, who uh, worked with me in government. He uh, uh, served in government for a career, which I did not. I spent nine years in government, but it's because of people like Woody Kessel that we're able to do what we're able to do when we're there for our short term. Uh, Woody was very close to uh, former Surgeon General C. Everett Coop whom, as you know, uh, passed uh, recently. So, but I'm delighted to see all of you, and I commend you for the outstanding work that you're doing. Um, I, um, I want to introduce you briefly to the Satya Health Leadership Institute before I get into my main presentation, because I want you to know a little bit about what we're trying to do. Um, I really appreciate the fact that people speak so highly of what I've done in the past, but I know you also say, well, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> and so I, the Satchel Health Leadership Institute attempts to answer that. I was very honored when the Morehouse School of Medicine decided to establish the Satchel Health Leadership Institute. It was after I had spent a period as interim president. And, uh, and when that period was up, the board voted that the institution should establish a Satchel Health Leadership Institute. Bill and Camille Cosby uh, provided $3 million as an initial endowment. And we got busy with the, the uh, mission of developing a diverse group of exceptional health leaders, because we think leadership is important, and I know you do too, uh, advance and support comprehensive health system strategies, and actively promote policies and practices that will reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities in health. I want to make it very clear that when we talk about disparities in health, we are talking about race and ethnicity. We are talking about mental health. We are talking about sexual health. We are talking about all those areas where people tend to get left out or not have access to quality health care or access to healthy lifestyles. Which, um, which is just as important. That's what the social determinants of health, um, the social determinants tell us that there are people who don't have access to the opportunities to lead healthy lifestyles. 
either because of where they live or what they have in terms of financial resources. And we have a responsibility to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to lead healthy lifestyles. And that's a part of the, the goal of, of, of global health equity. Um, we have three leadership development programs at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Now, this is sort of the commercial part. That's the reason they let me travel, is because I always market uh, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. <laughs> well, we have three leadership development programs. One is the Health Policy Fellowship, and that program is for health professionals who have completed their training and who come and spend one year with us actually studying health policy and health policy leadership. We've graduated four, four classes now of of about five fellows per year. A second leadership development program that we have is in the area of um, health promotion and disease prevention, and we um, develop community leaders. It's called a community health leadership program. We invite pastors and employers and other organizations in the community to select people uh, whom they would like to spend time with us learning how to come back, for example, come back to the church, to the community, and provide leadership in health promotion and disease prevention. Um, we, uh, when we started that program, it was only for the local community. And um, I remember speaking in Washington and about our program at a REACH uh, conference, the Racial Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. And when I finished, people in the audience in the question and answer period said, how can we uh, enroll in this program? And I explained to them that it was limited to the local community because we didn't have funds to travel people and put them up in hotels for that program. So I went back home, and a few days later, I got a call from the CDC. Said, well, if we pay for that, would you allow people to come from other states? And I said, oh, yes. And that was the beginning of this as a national program so we've had people from Maryland, especially Baltimore, to go through the Community Health Leadership Program, and we have people from all over the country now. Uh, that's the Community Health Leadership Program. The third program, which some people say is my favorite, I won't give an opinion on that, but it's, um, it's interesting. It's a program that's sponsored by our Behavioral um, Health Center, a Center on Behavioral Health. And um, it, it, we work with parents about 100 parents a year around the issue of early childhood development. Uh, we believe that if a child has an opportunity to get a healthy start in life from conception, and we go to, the f to five years, we know that we could go further, but we concentrate on those years from zero to five, helping parents to really provide quality parenting. Uh, and, you know, they learn the value of breastfeeding, the value of the way they live during pregnancy, the fact that, um, that stress during pregnancy impacts the developing baby, the fact that poor nutrition during pregnancy impacts the developing baby. Um, I think that program ultimately could make more difference uh, than any of the other programs that we have. And as I see the parents graduate, and we just graduated a, a group in June, um, I think these are parents who are empowered uh, to empower their children. Now, I know that's not easy, and I know there are a lot of other issues impacting the lives of our children uh, in our communities, but I believe that there is no substitute for the early development and that early development between parent and child. That has led us to a partnership with the schools in the Atlanta public school system where parents are now becoming much more active in working with teachers around child development. So that's uh, what we're doing at the Satchel Health Leadership Institute in part. We believe, uh, along with the Institute of Medicine, uh, it said in its 1988 report, that today the need for leaders is too great to leave their emergence to chance alone. Whether those leaders are health professionals or community leaders or parents providing quality development for their children. And uh, all over the world, as we travel with the social determinants of health, we saw the difference uh, that this kind of leadership can make. And you're seeing it right here, as I've witnessed this morning. Uh, 
Now, there are a lot of leadership lessons, and of course, there have been so many books written about leadership, um, and, and I'm working on one right now, so I'm guilty too. But um, uh, some of the leadership lessons of the Satchel Leadership Institute, uh, we believe that leadership responds to opportunities, challenges, and even to crises. Now, it is true that, that leadership responds to strategic plans, and sometimes I feel like if I never uh, went through another strategic plan, I'd be okay. <laughs> but despite strategic plans, uh, but seriously, despite strategic plans, what you find out in leadership is that you got to be ready to respond. And some of those things you got to be able to respond to are not in the strategic plan. But sometimes they're opportunities, and if you don't take advantage of them, they don't come back. Sometimes there are major challenges and crises. I've, during my time in government, I had to respond to Hurricane Floyd in North Carolina primarily, and, and even after government, had to respond to Hurricane Katrina. And to see people try to pick up the pieces and move on when their whole lives and livelihoods and neighborhoods have been destroyed, uh, leadership in crisis is, is critical. Leadership is a team sport. Um, we, uh, we believe that uh, we have to develop teams around us and that we have to, to manage those teams in order to move communities forward. So we don't believe that leadership is position dependence. Uh, we need leaders throughout the organization, leaders who take very seriously their role. And, and you know what happens when we start looking for people to fill positions we look for people who've already demonstrated leadership when they didn't have the quote leadership position because leadership is not position dependent. Effective leadership, in fact, does transform communities. Leadership requires a global perspective. That is more and more true every day. Uh, we live in a global community, and if you're not, if you don't have the perspective of what's happening in the world, you can really miss a lot. And finally, leadership is like a relay race. I love relay races. I ran track at Morehouse. I ran a little track. Most people would underline little. But, um, but I love the relay race, which I didn't run. I ran the distance. But uh, the beauty of a relay race, of course, is that you know the, the race does not end with you. Uh, it's about receiving and passing the baton to the person coming after you. And leaders know that what they're doing today will influence what happens tomorrow and that they have a responsibility beyond their leg of the race. And I think more and more we need, we need to, to make sure that people are aware of that. Sorry about that. Now you may ask, ask the question, um, when it comes to the Surgeon General, uh, how do we come by these reports, which are very important? And the first thing I want to say, since I think I released more reports than any other Surgeon General, um, the, the Surgeon General's reports are the results of a team effort, if, if I've ever seen one. Um, they are not based on anybody's personal opinion. Um, they are based on the work of a lot of people in the public health services. Uh, the science has to be cleared by NIH and the CDC and other agencies. And the beauty of the Surgeon General's report is that the American people have come to rely upon them for credible information. And um, as Daniel mentioned, I had the opportunity while Surgeon General to release that first ever Surgeon General's report on mental health. Uh, and it was quite an experience uh, working with people from all over the country, looking at this really critical area of mental health and trying to come together around what we know and what we don't know and where we need to go in solving the problems related to mental health. Why well, I released other reports, as you know, or held uh, the Surgeon General's report on overweight and obesity, and, uh, and, and all of those reports uh, have had their impact on the lives of the American people. Uh, but the mental health report uh, stands out. I do want to announce, in case you're not aware of it, that 2014 will be the 50th anniversary of the first ever Surgeon General's Report. Now, uh, most of you in this room, I won't say that. I started to say most of you were not born in 1964. Well, many of you were born in 1964, <laughs> but like that. But anyway, that was 50 years ago. 
And uh, believe it or not, there had not been an official Surgeon General's report before Luther Terry released the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. And next year, we're going we're gonna to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Surgeon General's report. But what I want to say this morning is that when you look at the history of the Surgeon General's report, and over 50 years, and the fact that virtually every Surgeon General since Luther Terry has released a report on smoking and health, and what's happened as a result of that, there are some lessons that I hope you do not miss. And some of them you're carrying out, of course. Uh, when you look at what's happened with smoking and health, one thing we know that when Luther Terry released his report, almost half of the American people were smokers, right? And today it's a little less than 20%, and we continue to move it downward. That's what we want to do with, with health problems. Um, as, um, as Marcus said, we want to measure the impact of what we're doing and be able to show that we're moving in the right direction. That's what we want to do. And I think we can say that about smoking and health. So why is that true? Why have we been successful at attacking this problem, though we still have ways to go? One is because we have clearly educated the American people about smoking and health. Uh, there, it would be hard to find an American who has not heard about the dangers of smoking, uh, who doesn't know um, about the relationship between smoking and lung cancer or, or heart disease. It, it's, it's been amazing, but we've, been, we've done a job, and we have to continue to do it, of pounding the American people with information about smoking and health. Uh, and that, that's critical for any public health issue. You know we've got to do that much better with mental health, right? You know we've got to do a much better job of that with behavioral health than we have already if we're going to be successful. Another thing that you will note about uh, smoking and health is that the research continues. Uh, we have not yet heard the last word from the research that's going on today in smoking and health. When uh, Luther Terry released his report, we didn't know that secondhand smoke was harmful to your health, did we? In fact, I think it was 1972 when Surgeon General Steinbach released this, the first research showing that you didn't have to be smoking yourself. A child living in an apartment building with parents who smoke, or depending on the walls, with neighbors who smoke, could be damaged by that smoke. The research has continued. But that's not all we've learned from smoking and health. We've learned uh, that we have to protect our children. Uh, whatever public health problem you want to mention, if we don't take care of our children, we're not going to win the battle. And that's why I'm so excited about our, our quality parenting program, is that we ought to prioritize the health of our children. They deserve to get a healthy start in life. And in case you're wondering, almost 20% of children in this country will have some mental health problem each year. So mental health and behavioral health is not just a problem of adults. Many mental health problems begin in childhood. And so if we're going to ever make progress in any kind of prevention, it's going to be because we get to this problem as early as possible. So we've got to keep our children in mind. Uh, what can we do as parents? What can we do as schools? What can we do as communities to promote the mental health of children? We learned that from smoking and health, right? You remember? Uh, we've got to restrict advertising uh, of cigarettes to children. Uh, we definitely got to restrict the sale of cigarettes to children. Why? Because we know that 90% of people who smoke begin to smoke before they're legally old enough to purchase tobacco. And they become addicted while they're children. And so we now know that we've got a target, not just in this country, but all over the world. So now we're working in Africa and India and all over the world trying to make sure that children do not become addicted. And finally, we have to have the right policies in place. So what do we do? We, we did introduce policies restricting uh, the sale of cigarettes to children. Then in 1987, California said, uh, we're going to restrict smoking in public places, 1987. And then on and on. And so now most states in the country restrict smoking. Those are policies that grew out of research. And we continue to examine policies. Some cities, some states have done better than others. Some do not allow smoking in any public places, including the parks. But policies, we've got to have the right policies in place 
That's why the Affordable Care Act is so critical. Because if, without the right policies, people with mental illness are not going to get care. Even if we, and hopefully we will be in time, successful in dealing with the stigma, unless we have the right policies in place, uh, barriers to access will continue. Well, I decided to take those few minutes because I think this is historic, and I wanted to make sure you didn't miss what we've learned from the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. As Surgeon General, uh, we actually released uh, three, uh, maybe four, depending on how you count them, uh, reports on mental health. The first one was that 1999 report, a re mental health, the report of the Surgeon General. Then uh, a year later, being mindful of children, we released, uh, I guess it was two years later, children's mental health, um, treating children with mental illness also was a part of that report. And it's, it's turned out to be quite helpful to a lot of people. And then finally, in 2000, August 2001, at the American Psychological Association meeting in San Francisco, and I know some of you were there, we released mental health, culture, race, and ethnicity. Uh, and I have seen some amazing things uh, happening in this country as people have attempted to deal with culture as it relates to mental health and mental illness. And, um, and so it's been interesting. I want to take a minute and talk about mental health. We talk a lot about mental illness, but I don't think we talk enough about mental health. Uh, the issue of mental health is really what binds us all together. See, because we all have challenges to our mental health or whether we want to admit it or not. The reason we have stigma is because people don't want to admit that we all have challenges when it comes to our mental health, right? So we look down upon people. We don't want to know. Uh, we don't want people to know if somebody in our family has mental illness because we just assume that mental health, mental health is not an issue for us. We can take our mental health for granted. The first point I want to make this morning is that none of us can take our mental health for granted. None of us. And sooner or later, uh, we come to grips with that fact, uh, either by you know, our own experiences or having to take care of somebody in our family or, or working with somebody who needs help. But I like, I like the definition of mental health. I don't know what your definition is, but our definition in the first report was that mental health is, is it's a successful performance of mental functions resulting in productive activities and fulfilling relationships with other people, beginning with family, right? Uh, the ability to adapt to change and the ability to successfully deal with adversity. H had any adversity in your life recently? You know, don't take for granted, you know, what, is, what it takes to deal with adversity, what it takes for individuals and families. Mental health is, is the ability. So you can be mentally healthy today and not so healthy tomorrow. Anybody in this room could be mentally healthy today and not so healthy tomorrow. I want to drive that point home because I'm fighting stigma when it comes to mental disorders. I'm fighting the fact that as a society, we still look down upon people with mental disorders. Uh, we assume that something strange about that, but let me just say, just as things go wrong with the heart, the lungs, the liver, and the kidneys, those major organs, right? Things go wrong with the brain. They always have and they always will. The only question is, how will we respond? Now, I've been working with the National Football League now for the last four years around this issue of dementia in former football players. And, and of course, what we learned, of course, is that when we were out there cheering uh, the head-to-head -head hits, uh, we were cheering the fact that many people were, were going to have concussions that were going to lead uh, them to suffer dementia. And, uh, and now we see all of these former players uh, either committing suicide or having no memory of their past. Tony Dorsett, uh, I was on a program with Tony a few years ago, and he told me about what it was like to, be, to suffer a hit and to play half of the game and not remember anything about it. Well, he gained over 100 yards, but he didn't remember anything about it. And now he's saying that you know, he can't remember sometimes his children. Uh, but so we have, as a society, we have taken the brain for granted, right? Uh, we don't protect it. 
We, even, we have sports where the brain, the head is the main object, which means the brain. Um, and I'm not just talking about NFL football players. I'm talking about the fact that last year over 200,000 high school students suffered concussions in all kinds of sports, football, soccer, even cheerleaders suffer concussions. The fact that we have not protected the brain means that we take our mental health for granted. We take our brains for granted. So go back to the four areas of definition of mental health, productive activities, ability to adapt to change, fulfilling relationships with other people, successfully coping with adversity. Now, believe it or not, most of us struggle with those areas every day. Uh, our mental health is challenged every day. Our children, if we don't develop the right relationships with our children, uh, they're going to pay for it. Now, many people have come to me and said, uh, you know, we have all of these mass shootings. Uh, the one here recently, I was here when they, the Alexis shooting occurred at the Naval Yard. Uh, I was Surgeon General when the Columbine shooting occurred. Many of you remember that in Colorado. So I've seen, I've, I've seen all of these, um, these outbursts of violence. And, uh, and then when that happens, of course, Virginia Tech, people will stop and say, there's something wrong with the mental health system when people like this are able to walk around on the street. We will say that, and, and then we'll get upset about that for a while. I remember Columbine. Uh, the Surgeon General's report on youth violence prevention was the only report I did that was requested by both the White House and the Congress. Do you know why? Because the American people were up in arms, literally, uh, after the Columbine shooting. But uh, before the Surgeon General's report on youth violence prevention came out, we had gone back to business as usual. Uh, sort of forgotten about it, and that's what happens. So I agree that when people engage in mass shooting, most of the time they are suffering from uh, mental disorders. But uh, let me just say clearly this morning that the Youth Violence Report said that a lot of people are suffering from behavior disorders. Uh, what about all of the children who are being killed out in the street? What about all the gang violence? Uh, are those behavioral disorders? What about the fact that we are raising children who feel so insecure that they feel like they have to be a member of a gang to be safe? That they have to be armed to, to be safe? Is that a behavioral health problem? Or is it just the people who, who really go off and kill up 20, 26 people? My position is that we're dealing with a lot of behavioral health problems in this society. We have failed our children in many cases. Fathers walking away from families, children growing up trying to figure out what did I do wrong? Why doesn't my father care about me? So yeah, we have problems with relationships and we have behavioral health problems as a result of it. There were some key messages in the Surgeon General's report on mental health and I'll go rapidly through them because I know all of you read it, right? Mental health is fundamental to overall health and well-being. Mental disorders are real. There are still people who don't believe they're real. I just saw an article the other day I was reading, I forget uh, what paper, but where people were arguing. It may have been New York Times on Sunday that had this discussion about how people do view mental health. And the question in the minds of a lot of people, well, are mental disorders real? It was. Uh, it actually came out of a World Health Organization study. Mental disorders are real. Mental disorders are disabling. The World Health Organization studies show that disability adjusted life years are as common from mental disorders as they are from cancer and heart disease. And the World Health Organization predicts that by 2020, our depressive disorders alone to be a major cause of disability in the world. Depression is rising rapidly in the world. So mental disorders are disabling in terms of premature deaths and lost productivity. Um, now this last sentence here, I want to clear it up a little bit. Life expectancy of people who suffer from severe mental illness, severe mental illness, average of 25 years less than the rest of the population. Is that not a disparity? 
Um, people who are suffering from mental illness suffer at least three kinds of disparities. They suffer a disparity in their own health, life expectancy. They suffer disparities in terms of, of access to care. And they suffer disparities in terms of community and opportunities within the community. So major disparities in the area of mental health. But that was a dramatic finding just a few years ago, about the 25 years. And in the United States, mental disorders are common. And in the world, mental disorders are common. One in five Americans will have a diagnosable mental disorder each year. One in four, one in five. We vacillate between those, but a lot of Americans will suffer a mental disorder, and many of them will never be diagnosed. In fact, most of them will not be diagnosed. Research has improved our ability to recognize, diagnose, and treat conditions effectively. And 80 to 90% of mental disorders are treatable using medication and other therapies. Another program of the Satchel Leadership Institute, which I've um, found quite engaging and interesting, uh, we decided uh, four years ago to volunteer with the help of the state and some funding to take over mental health emergencies at Grady Hospital. Grady Hospital is uh, one of the largest public hospitals in the country, the largest in the South. And we were very curious about what's happening to people with mental disorders. Um, in, so, since so few of them are under adequate treatment, and we decided to look at the emergency room, so we, just, we volunteered to take over mental health emergencies. And of course, people thought we were, we were out of it because we were doing this, but we wanted, to, we wanted to learn what we could do because most people with mental disorders are not, were not in care with primary care providers or mental health specialists. So where were they getting care when they got care? They were getting it in the emergency room. The most expensive form of care and the worst form of care, when you think about it, it has to be, it has to be done, somebody has to do it. It's not the best way to provide care. So we took it over, and after two years, uh, we were able to, we learned a lot. We were able to show that uh, we could reduce the waiting time for people with mental health emergencies by 80%. You know, like when they send out for the psychiatrist to come in, we were right there. I, I had a psychiatrist who had just finished a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at UCLA and had said she wanted to work with me, so uh, she led that effort. And it was amazing. Reduced waiting time by 80%. Now, this is what the state was so excited about. And we were a little excited about it, too. We reduced the cost of taking care of this population of patients by almost 50%. And what we did, of course, we connected with the community health centers, starting with the Grady Community Health Center. And so when people were seen in the emergency room, we connected them to a continuity of care, of relationships. And that's how we got into the uh, integration of mental health and primary care. We felt that if we could really make sure that every mental health patient had a primary care provider, uh, but they also had access to mental health services as they needed them, that we could really get on top of this problem. We could prevent people from running back and forth to the emergency room. And it's been a, quite an experience. We now have 10, 10 community health centers where we're integrating mental health and primary care, where we believe that having teams of people with mental health specialists and primary care providers working together is the best way to take care of mental health problems. Uh, it, uh, it reduces the stigma because you don't have to go somewhere else to get mental health care. You get it in the same place where you get all of your other health services. And you have a team of people with all of the expertise you need, but also uh, people with mental disorders have heart disease too, right? They have cancer. Why do you think that the life expectancy is 25 years less? Because people with mental disorders are much more likely to be obese, much more likely to smoke. And so we have to view it more comprehensively. Well, the, the good news, of course, as you know, most likely, is that we continue to, to do research. Remember the smoking analogy? And the research that we are doing have, has improved our ability to recognize, di diagnose, and treat these conditions. 80 to 90% of mental disorders are, in fact, treatable. 80 to 90% using medication and other therapies. Isn't that good news? 
That is good news. However, there's bad news. Of those with a diagnosable mental disorder, fewer than half of adults get help, and only one-third of children. That is shocking. I mean, that is truly shocking. We can change that. I mean, I, I'm telling you, we can change that. We can make a difference in these statistics, measurable differences. And I'm sure that we're going to do that. Well, the stigma word is a big word. Uh, when I left government um, almost 12 years ago now, but um, I left government and went, went back to Atlanta, which is close to the farm where I grew up in Alabama. But I joined the Morehouse School of Medicine and um, had, had released these reports on mental health and, and decided with the help of the Fuqua Foundation to, to really engage the community. So for a year, we had quarterly forums on mental health in which we would invite people from the community. It was in the evening. We would provide heavy hors d'oeuvres so they wouldn't have to go worry about going home and getting back there. It came, came directly there. What, what surprised me, of course, is that we averaged about 500 people for each one of these community forums. And we talked about uh, mental health. We talked about uh, education and mental health. We talked about violence. We had uh, school teachers attending in great numbers. We had policemen. The interest in the whole issue of mental health in the community is much higher than you think. And it's time for us to really come together and engage the community around this issue. But stigma affects individuals. There are people who have mental health problems, and they don't want anybody to know it, right? Because there's so much stigma around it. Even parents sometimes don't want the community to know that their child has a mental health problem, and so they don't seek help, right? Um, that, that's really sad, but it's true. But what about policy? Well, we have a real problem with the way the government deals with mental illness and mental health. And um, it has been a struggle to get the right policies in place. Uh, the major recommendation of the Surgeon General's report on mental health was parity of access to mental health services. Uh, we've been struggling with that a long time. In fact, it goes back to 1996. But um, and make a long story short, it was not until 2008 uh, October 2008, that President Bush signed the Mental Health Parity Act. Uh, now, we had worked with uh, the Clinton administration, uh, with the leadership of Senator Kennedy, Senator Ted Kennedy, and the leadership of his son Patrick in the House um, to get to that point. I remember going to, on the Hill, uh, to really push for the passage of the Mental Health Parity and Equity Act. And uh, I went to visit Patrick Kennedy, and then I went to visit Senator Kennedy. And Senator Kennedy said, Dr. Satcher, I, we, I could pass this law if I could just get my son in line. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my son is insisting that, uh, that substance abuse addiction be a part of this law, and I just don't believe it's going to pass that way. Um, and so that was a, well, I had to tell Senator Kennedy that I, this time I agreed with his son. And, and as you know, in time, we were able to get, as a part of the Affordable Care Act, the Mental Health, the Parity and Equity and Substance Abuse Act. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is the best opportunity we've had to get it right when it comes to mental, mental, mental illness and the treatment. It's not perfect, but it's the best opportunity we've had because uh, mental illness is considered an essential health service, right? That's what the Affordable Care Act said. You can't, it, it's, it's to be treated just as any other essential service. And that's a major step forward. And we've got to make sure that we take advantage of that. Rapidly, and let me just say, because I think you know already that culture counts. Obviously, you're involved with several different cultures. You know that people have different attitudes toward mental and behavioral health based on their culture. Um, you know that people manifest and describe their illnesses different. Um, they cope differently. Some people, it, you know, I grew up in an environment where it was religion. You know, neither of my parents uh, finished elementary school, but they had this deep faith. And, um, and, they, and they played it out in their lives. And it, it benefited, um, you know, the health of, of their family. 
that was what they had. That's all they had. The type of stresses people experience related to culture. Whether they're willing to seek treatment is related to culture. So you, you can't separate culture from, from these problems. But what about those of us who are health professionals, right? Well, does our culture interfere? When we think about culture, we think about those patients, right? And we've got to deal with all of these. But what about our culture? And I can tell you, uh, there is a culture of medicine and public health and nursing. We all have our cultures. They impact the way patients are treated, they're diagnosed, and how services are organized and financed. And so, um, as you've heard when it comes to coverage, uh, culture allowed the government to go all of those years without including uh, mental health services in uh, essential services. It was culture that allowed that. A culture where people said it's okay to leave uh, mental health out. That can no longer be the case. Um, now there are, there are racial disparities when it comes to mental health, but not what you think. Uh, we found no disparities when it, when it came to the prevalence of mental health uh, problems. What we found were disparities in the burden of mental health problems, right? We found disparities in the burden. Um, I, I was just thinking about um, Hispanics. We found the rate of mental illness uh, to be similar uh, to, to non-Hispanic whites, but Hispanic women tend to suffer uh, depression more often. Asian Americans, so for each group there was something unique. Uh, Asian Americans had the highest rate of stigma uh, and most, least likely to seek care. African Americans were only twi uh, half as likely to seek outpatient care as whites. Asian Americans were half as likely as African Americans to seek therapy. So stigma impacts different groups differently. Access to care is different from different groups, for different groups. American Indians, um, I, I visited several reservations during the time that I was in office. and. Um, and I know, um, if you know anything about the history of that population, then you know that there are, there are reasons for major problems, whether it's alcoholism, depression, and what have you. And, and we've got to get to the bottom of all of these things as one nation. But there are serious issues uh, with our system. Well, um, substance abuse was included in the Affordable Care Act, and that's a really good thing. Access to treatment for substance abuse is critical. And uh, as you see here, people with mental disorders are more likely to have substance abuse addiction. That shows it pretty well. If you look at um, the adults who had um, substance abuse addiction, then 40% of them had mental disorders. So there's a connection, of course, uh, between substance abuse addiction, and this shows it too. The more serious the mental illness, the more likely uh, people are to suffer uh, dependence on substance abuse. So there's a connection here that we have to be aware of if we're going to make a difference in this, in this area. I was thinking about the story of, uh, of the uh, Texas farmer who uh, was from a 5,000 acre farm and he was traveling across the southeast to look at other farms and he stopped uh, in South Carolina to speak with the South Carolina farmer and he started off by saying, uh, how big is your farm here? And the South Carolina farmer had not thought about that so he said, well maybe 60 or 70 acres. And the Texas farmer thought to himself, my goodness, you know, my farm is 5,000 acres. If I told this guy he wouldn't even understand. So he said, sir, do you realize that there are some mornings when I get in my truck just as the sun is coming up and I will drive across my land and when the sun is going down, I still have not reached the end of my land. The, the South Carolina farmer thought about that a while and he said, you know I used to have a truck like that. <laughs> well, there's something wrong with the truck, right? And, uh, we, we're big, we have the biggest health system in the world, and I've looked at them all over the world, but there's something wrong with the truck, and we've got to fix it. Uh, it's going to take new attitudes, it's going to take new leadership, it's going to take new policies. 
but we've got to fix the truck that makes our health system go, and everybody has got to be included. The social determinants of health must be a part of, of what we deal with, and, and I have a lot of medical students and nursing students and others saying, well, how, what does that have to do with me because, uh, because um, you know, I'm not out there, how can I affect the social determinants of health? It's about your theme, it's about partnership. It's only gonna happen if you have the right partnerships, and that's what Health to People 2020 is about. Uh, go back and look at the Affordable Care Act, and you will see how it will expand mental health and substance use, and uh, most health plans must now cover preventive services, including depression screening. And starting in 2014, plans won't be able to deny coverage or charge more due to the pre-existing health condition, including mental illness. Now, don't think that I'm blind to the fact that there's all kind of debate and controversy about the Affordable Care Act, but I'm telling you the promise of the Affordable Care Act would move us dramatically forward in terms of mental health. This is the Surgeon General's prescription, which I started passing out in 1999. I'm talking about physical activity, servings of fruits. But I want you to know that uh, the brain is a part of the body, isn't it? And what we found is that physical activity reduces depression and elevates mood. Studies show that physical activity improves mental acuity. Try it. Studies show that physical activity improves sleep. And studies show that physical activity reduces stress and anxiety. So we've been touting physical activity because it's good for the heart and good for the muscles, but I want you to know that it's good for the brain, which is a major part of the body. Um, the McKinley population model is important because downstream we deal with individuals, whether they're patients or not. Midstream, we deal with the community, and that includes trying to reduce the stigma in the community. And upstream, we try to make sure that we have the right policies in place. At the Satchel Health Leadership Institute, we believe that in order to eliminate disparities in health, we need leaders who care enough, know enough, will do enough, and will persist until a job is done. Thank you.